All righty. So welcome in. Glad to have you all here on this fine, sunny Wednesday morning, at least here in Seattle. Um, very excited about that myself. Happy spring. So we are together today for our School Housing Community Partnerships training. Um, this is our third of four sessions, and this is actually the last session that will be offered um, online. Um, we have a, an exciting uh, thing that we'll share more about at the end of our training um, that will include some of this topic. So um, we're going to move through it. Um, starting it off, we'll give a quick introduction of our team. Um, recognize some of your names and faces um, and others are new. So always good to reintroduce who we are. My name is Joey Heilman. I use she her pronouns. I am a senior, the senior education strategy specialist um, at Building Changes. I'll pass it to Sammy. Morning, everyone. Happy to have you here with us. Um, my name is Sammy Iverson. I use she her pronouns. I work for Building Changes as a senior manager education strategy. And um, I'm going to pass it off to Kayla. Good morning. My name is Caleb Lau. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a consultant with Building Changes. All right. Thanks, team. Um, so we will have a moment for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat um, in about two slides. So hang, hang tight on that chat introduction. Um, before we jump any further, we um, would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, so Building Changes would like to acknowledge the Indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit the area today. Um, Building Changes is on the land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. Um, we encourage you to check out the nativeland.ca map um, to see whose land you are on um, and see. Um, I, the link is exciting because they actually did some updates recently. Um, I know a lot of folks have used this map, um, but they did updates, so it is uh, more accurate to the land that you are on. So please take a look at your address um, and see who, where you are. A um, little bit of Zoom etiquette, and this is where we're going to have you do your introductions in the chat. So um, first things first, please make sure that your Zoom name in PD and Roller um, matches what your Zoom name is here if you're seeking clock hours. So um, yeah, just make sure that first last is on your Zoom's name here. So we can do attendance properly later for that credit. Um, and now is when I would love it if everyone could introduce yourselves in the chat, pop in your name, your role, your pronouns, um, where you're joining from today and whose land you are on. Um, so again, name, pronouns, role, like organization, school district, and then whose land. Um, and we'll start seeing who's in the space with us today. Um, while y'all are typing that up, I'll just continue on with a few other Zoom things. Um, we've been doing this for a while. None of this is a surprise. Please stay muted when you're not speaking. Um, if we do have some like random unmuting introductions, I will uh, probably use my muting power to, to mute you if it is an accidental unmuting. Um, there is a live transcript available um, that should be working. You should be able to put up those live captions or transcript. Um, if not, please, uh, message me and let me know. On the messaging me topic, um, Sammy and I are both logged into our education Zoom account, which means Zoom gets really confused. And so sometimes if you send me a direct message, it goes to Sammy or Sammy sends a message, it comes up looking like I sent it. So just know if you're messaging Sammy or I, you may be messaging the other, but we, you know, two two brains think like one, we'll, we'll make it happen for you. Um, still trying to figure out a good workaround for that uh, fun Zoom update. Um, and then we'd love it if you could use reaction buttons throughout. Um, so if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that little reactions option. You can do a little thumbs up, claps, hearts. Thank you, Kayla. Um, love it, Anam, thank you. Um, this is a really great way to have uh, some interaction and feedback throughout the presentation. Um, then feel free to use the raise hand function during Q&A portions. Um, we would love it if other folks came off mute and please use the chat throughout as well. We will do our best to answer questions as they arise. And if we can't answer questions as they arise, we'll get to it later or circle back with you um, to figure out how who to connect you with, who has an answer. Um, love seeing all the introductions in the chat, thank you. Um, 
really quick, we're also going to drop a link to the um, Survey Monkey. This is for after the training, but I think I find it helpful to send it ahead of time, open it up in your browser, and just minimize it until the end of the training. But that way, you have it up so you remember to do it at the end. We really value your feedback. Um, helps us as presenters and trainers make sure that we're really delivering the content in a way that works for everyone. Um, and if you're doing PD Enroller, you'll want to do the survey through PD Enroller for clock hours. But I'll explain that again later. All right, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Sammy. Thanks, Joey. Um, just want to say, reading the chat and seeing the intros, um, I want to say welcome to some familiar folks that we've seen in previous trainings. Um, I also would love to say welcome to those who are new today. Um, I love seeing the different mix of both school districts, nonprofits, foster care. We have a lot of expertise in the room. So super excited to be with you today. Um, if you haven't heard of us, some of you may have, some of you may have not. Um, just in case, Building Changes is a nonprofit working with and alongside communities across Washington State to explore the intersections of systems serving young people, students, and families experiencing homelessness. Um, some of our work involves funding innovative ideas, providing technical assistance and training, project and program research and evaluation, and advocacy efforts that really aim to change policies to strengthen implementation. Um, in our next slide, what we want to highlight here is some of our research um, from 2019. We found that six out of 10 students experiencing homelessness are students of color. We bring a targeted universalism lens um, that was coined by John A. Powell to our work, which really acknowledges equity rather than equality. We no longer believe that everyone should receive the same level of support, but believe in prioritizing the needs of those most marginalized. By doing so, there's a universal benefit. And to be really clear, this is not about preference. This is about acknowledging that people are situated differently and have varying needs. Um, we include this infographic just to make sure that we're centering students furthest from educational justice and access to resources and opportunities. Um, so what we also know is that our research has shown that doubled up students have equally poor academic outcomes as their literally homeless peers, meaning housing stability is a key factor in furthering student learning and academic outcomes. Um, we're going to dive a little deeper into that today. Um, but this is just kind of getting us grounded as we um, start our training with you all today. Um, the next slide, this one's just really simply outlining that um, we were lucky enough to have a contract with OSPI um, through American Rescue Plan dollars. And you may have seen us way back in the day at a McKinney-Vento training in 2018 before the pandemic. Um, but we've been in partnership with OSPI for years and we're excited to continue our work together. As Joey mentioned, this is the third version of this training. So we had seven trainings, offered each of them four times. And we're gonna see that close out in fall of um, this year. So if you've been here before, you might know um, Joey and our little team here are fans of Mentimeter. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna um, click this link in chat. It's gonna take you to a site where you will answer the question, what does partnership mean to you? What are three words that you believe describe or exemplify partnership? Again, another way to just get us thinking today about partnership, what it means to us, and why collaboration is so important. And, oh yes, it's working. I was gonna say, if you've been with Mentimeter and us before, sometimes it's awesome and it works really well and other times it doesn't. But this morning we are, we're rolling with Mentimeter. I love it. All right, looks like we've got strength, collaboration, communication and communicate, empowerment. Ooh, it's moving quick, hard to read. I love it. <laughs> um, talents together, community. And I love this because as, as folks enter a word that someone else has already entered, it gets bigger so we can really see kind of what, what is at the heart of our, our partnership um, understanding. Communication and collaboration are really coming in hot this morning. Teamwork, thank you. And yes, Susan, great example. If, if for whatever reason Mentimeter is not working for you, please use the chat. Um, we would love to still have your input.
seeing a lot of themes about um, communication and authentic, like, uh, oh, it's all moving. <laughs> <laughs> working, yeah, it's a lot of working together. Uh, selflessness, that's a good one. All right, we'll give it maybe 10 more seconds. Ooh, collaboration, cooperation and teamwork popping in the chat. Not seeing teamwork coming up as strong on the mentee. So we'll, we're just gonna remember that it's coming in strong in the chat too. Oh, it is on the mentee, just keeps moving. Right, collaboration and communication are like head to head right now. <laughs> All right, so when we finish this training, um, I will be sending out a version, a copy of all the slides that we're doing. So you will get copies of the slides with links and all. Um, and we'll also have a screenshot of this word cloud that we have come up with today for you to reference back to. All right, I'm gonna move forward. Wow, y'all are, it's just still moving. This is amazing. I know, it's I love beautiful. It. Such an active mentor group today. Fantastic. All right. Menti is a really cool platform. I have so much fun with it. Sometimes she likes to do her own thing though. We'll definitely say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick, just running through the agenda here. Um, we're gonna, after this, we're gonna shift to talk a little bit about kind of the definitional misalignment of homelessness as seen by the Department of Ed and Homeless and urban development or HUD, so to speak. Um, we think that that's an important thing to highlight when doing school housing partnership work. Um, we're gonna think in, we're gonna think deeper about partnership and what that looks like. We have a really fun activity um, where we can start kind of mapping resources and connections you have in your local community. Um, we're gonna move into strategies. Um, we're gonna have a guest speaker from YDEC here today and then have a little bit more kind of opportunities to um, reflect on what we learned today and then we'll be done right around noon, hopefully right at noon. <laughs> We're usually, we usually can make it happen. So um, objectives also today, these are really tied um, closely to PD and Roller, um, but I'm not going to read through them. These are just kind of where we hope to get to today. And um, again, you'll see those again show up. We're gonna transition now I'm going to hand it off to Kayla, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about um, defining homelessness across housing and education systems. Thanks, Sammy. Um, so I know we have a lot of experts in the room, folks that live and breathe McKinney-Vento, and so I'm just going to give a quick overview, um, because without fail, every training we have someone say, I just got thrown into this role, and I, I don't know, you know um, much about McKinney-Vento, so... Uh, every training, we like to just do a quick recap, and um, there's a lot of wisdom in the room, so please feel free to come off mute and, you know, add your voices or add in the chat. Um, so McKinney-Vento is a federal law that protects the educational rights of students experiencing homelessness, and every district, as we all know, it seems like we have a lot of liaisons um, in the room, but every district has a McKinney-Vento liaison. Um, and in Washington state, every school building has a building point of contact that um, is meant to protect the confidentiality of students experiencing homelessness and be the one point of contact between the McKinney-Vento liaison um, to ensure that they have support services and enrollment. And um, eligibility is uh, determined by, as children who lack, um, a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And so sometimes this can look like, you know, traditional shelters um, or hotel motels, uh, living in cars, um, but this can also look like doubled up uh, families that are um, staying with family members or friends um, due to economic hardship and couch surfing. Um, I also wanted to just highlight because we always get a, a question about um, documentation status and I just want to, uh, reiterate that students are eligible for support services regardless of citizenship status. Um, and that should not be, you know, any type of deciding factor in um, the accessing their rights to education. Um, and as Sammy uh, mentioned, there is a confusing misalignment between how HUD or Housing and Urban Development, our um, federal housing uh, department, um, defines homelessness and how the Department of Education defines homelessness. Um, and so HUD 
does not include doubled up in their um, definition. And so we just wanted to highlight that misalignment, not to um, confuse folks, but more so just to lift up that that misalignment can cause um, some confusion in accessing services and to really highlight the, the importance of um, partnerships between um, you know, advocates on, on the housing side and advocates on the school side so that uh, folks can access services seamlessly. And the next slide just has a little bit of a clear um, uh, visual about that misalignment. And so, um, you know, that both HUD and DOE define unsheltered locations like um, uh, tent cities or emergency shelters, hotels and motels uh, as homeless, but doubled up is the tricky one um, where housing and urban development say only under extremely narrow conditions. Um, and if you want to learn more about that misalignment, then uh, we do have a McKinney Vento deeper dive training. Um, there is videos on the Building Changes website uh, if you want to check that out. And I will pass to Joe. Awesome. Thank you, Kayla. Um, I want to take a moment before we dive into our next section. Um, if anyone has uh, I've got a minute or two, we could do any quick questions or things that have come up for you um, from that last section on that definition of homelessness. And also shout out to Sammy for dropping all of those links. Um, even if it looks like I dropped them on some of your screens, it was Sammy. <laughs> All right, I am not seeing anyone racing for the raise hand button. Um, and if a, ooh, Jonathan asking about those narrow definitions of doubled up. Um, I believe that Kayla or Sammy will have the quickest answer for that one. Um, and it may be deep into one of those links that we shared. Um, and we do have a bunch of slides at the end of this training, kind of really going a little deeper into the different categories of homeless per HUD's definition um, that will be sent out and shared um, when I share the slides. Ooh, great question, Diana, on um, families that are fleeing or seeking ref like refugee status. Um, Kayla, I see you're off mute. Do you want to? Sorry yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so similar to um, citizenship questions, uh, regardless of why the family is experiencing homelessness, it could be um, fleeing violence or seeking refugee status. If they lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, then they qualify for McKinney-Vento services. Does that so, answer your question, Diana? So even um, if they're fleeing, but they have secure housing, that does not qualify them for our program. So if they're how so it's kind of a if the if they're new to the area and the housing they have is not a permanent housing opportunity like it's a very it's a temporary thing while they're trying to figure it out um there is like there is space for them to if they fall under that uh not fixed regular or adequate mm -hmm. um which oftentimes families who are new to the area like they may not have that um, stability yet right they're staying in a hotel that's being paid for by the church or resettlement agency. Um, and sometimes this does come up as well. If a you know, family is staying in a hotel temporarily, they know that they're going to be moving into a different school district. So wanting to get the student enrolled in the district they're going to be moving into, but they're not in a permanent place yet. So there, there's a lot of nuance within it. And um, I know that we have some folks in the room who have um, been supporting this as well within their districts. Um, so I'm going to definitely would be happy to connect you with them. And there's also um, a, a brief, a couple of different briefs that I don't have that link quick access ready, but we can make sure to pop into the chat for you. That really breaks it down. I think it's from Schoolhouse Connection. They have a really good, um, yeah, really good page on really understanding that a little deeper. Thank you. Yeah. I would also say that um, kind of the overarching takeaway when it comes to McKinney Vento, because it can be so tricky, right? Um, whether it's doubled up, whether it's folks fleeing or seeking refuge, I would say, um, think about, again, that fixed, regular, adequate, but also just always remember it's very case by case. So there's not a blanket way to say, this is a fit, 
this family's in, this family isn't. So whether you're an advocate from a community org or whether you're working as a liaison, um, it's really just about hearing the nuance, as Joey's mentioned, around, around that situation um, and taking into account um, really kind of that, that predictable, safe space. Um, I think that I think there's always room to say within this certain family situation, I can advocate for them being McKinney Vento and this is why. So I would just always kind of be okay with falling back on like, this is what I've heard and this is their situation and then advocating with the information that you have. Yeah, thank you, Sammy. And I see that Kayla found those uh, links that I was referencing. So thank you for popping those in. Definitely recommend giving those a read through. All right, so this next section we're gonna pop into here is um, conceptualizing partnership and collaboration. I think this is, um, I love this topic. I think it's something that we all know, like instinctually being in this work, how important um, cross-system cross collaboration and partnership is, but we don't necessarily always take the time to sit down and define it and why it's important. So this is really just taking that step back and being like, all right, why is this important in the work? Like we inherently know it is, but let's, let's really take a step back and look at that. Um, so here's a couple of different reasons of why process and collaboration is important. Um, you know, you've got a community wide network of supports um, for our students and families. It's really important to be able to give those warm handoffs, right? If you're referring a family, it's a lot easier for a family to want to work with another service provider if they already have a trusting relationship with you and you say, hey, I'm going to connect you to so and so that I know over here, right? And be able to do that warm handoff. That can be a very powerful way. Um, for families to continue in that process and also can maybe hopefully make it so they don't have to share their story quite as often um, if that partnership exists. Um, quicker access to resources, um, hopefully, like I was saying, less families are gonna slip through the cracks um, of the service system. We know it's a complicated system, so the more partnerships we can have to help navigate through it, the better. Um, it can also help with uh, resources and expertise being shared and effective outreach. This is just a brief list. We know there are tons of other reasons um, that process and collaboration is important. And like we went over with the um, differences in the HUD versus Department of Education definition, having a partnership across those systems where that difference is understood and how to kind of work around and within it between um, your, your two sides of the system can be really powerful um, to support families and connect them to resources. All right, so here is a, um, oh, I, yeah, all right, here is a model that um, we kind of came up with, we we're looking for like, okay, are there like models that represent like, what are the key pieces of creating a sustaining partnership and through um, our different work and looking at other models that existed, we actually kind of came up with our own. Um, so this is um, what I call visualizing, creating and sustaining partnership. So that large outer bubble, the gray one, is shared community. You know, you're going to be joining into a partnership with folks that you share community with. You are sharing um, resources. You're you know, working with the same families. And then the key pieces that go into that partnership are time, right? It, it takes time to create partnership. It takes time to build trust and rapport with each other, right? Like you're, you want to make sure that before you refer a family to someone that you trust them too, right? And I know that you all care so much about the families and students you work with. So that, that is a key piece and that does take time. And then communication, which you all had um, on real high in that uh, word cloud earlier. And all of these things put together really create partnership. Um, so just wanna sit with this for a little bit. Um, the idea of this is really trying to move from a transactional model um, within our system. So instead of being like, you know, checking the box, like, cool, I made my referral, um, moving into that really relational space um, to be able to better support our families and really have those solid partnerships. Um, and Kayla did drop, drop a link to uh, another model and way to conceptualize partnership that uh, we found helpful. All right. So we know what partnership is, we know that's important. Um, where do you start, right? You might you might have some really good partnership um, in your 
district already or in your community, or you might be really wanting more and looking for that opportunity. So there are a couple of different um, like tools that we can use to do this. Um, resource mapping and eco mapping are two of them. There are a lot of other ones, but those are the ones we're focusing on today. Um, and they can really help you answer these questions and visualize your network. So what partnerships already exist in your community? Which partnerships can be strengthened? Who else is in your community? You know, who, who don't you have those partnerships with? And are there opportunities to create new partnerships? So these are kind of the, the core questions that we ask ourselves when thinking about our um, community partnership map. This is gonna lead us into our activity, which is um, an eco-mapping activity that um, we have again adapted and created uh, for you all. It's going to be in uh, Miro board, not Mentimeter, Miro board. I get them confused sometimes when I'm speaking. Um, and I will kind of talk through more about how to use that system in a couple of slides, but I'm start, going to start with giving an example of an eco map of this style. So this is our eco map. This is an example one that I created um, from a community that I worked in back in Colorado. Um, so you can see that in the center you've got school districts, and then all the little petals off the flower. Wow, I didn't realize it was a flower until I just said it. Um, are the different kinds of support that you may have in your community. So you've got your youth support programs, housing, food and basic needs, family and community support, supports, health, and then other miscellaneous. The, this is, again, a model that can be adapted if you want to use it really in your community. And you can change kind of what, what topic each little circle is. You could add more. Um, we just wanted to simplify it for today's um, activity in a short time. So going deeper into this, you see at the center here, we've got the school district. Um, and at the center of everything is the student and family, right? So uh, because you know a lot of our work is coming from that school district side, that's why we have school districts in the middle. We also recognize that that's where students spend the majority of their time is in school. So that is like a really central point to start connecting with our students and families. Um, and then we kind of are breaking it into um, different circles within that. So what what are the services that are provided within your school district? Um, you know, do you have a strong MPSS model you're using? How's your transportation for your McKinney Vento students? Um, do students have access to free and reduced lunch and breakfast? Do all students have access to that in your district? I know that's, you know, be great if we got that statewide, we're working on that. Um, and then what are the internal relationships? So this is thinking about what departments in your district work together. You know, you've got your McKinney Vento and foster care liaisons, working with your food service folks, um, is there, are there after school programs that are connected to the district? Um, what's the support like from your district leadership? Um, how about connecting with school social workers, those building points of contact, right? Um, and then where are the gaps um, in those services? So um, yes, Christy, we're gonna drop links and we're actually gonna use them ourselves. So this is just my example one and then you're gonna dive in yourself. Um, so gaps in services and REL is relationships, shorthanded. Um, so one thing that we know is happening across is maybe there is uh, more student support staff to meet the demand, right? So then when we come out into one of those pedals, we're looking at housing um, today um, for this example is, all right, who is a housing, like what's the housing resource in the community? In Boulder, it was Boulder Housing Partners. And then from here, I was able to add in details on what services does BHP provide? Is there a current relationship with the school district? Um, and for Boulder Housing Partners, they had a bringing school home initiative when I was working there. And then what are the gaps in services? And one of the gaps is they're actually not connected to all the schools in the district, just a few of them, right? Um, they didn't do direct rental assistance funds at that time. There's limited available units, right? Um, and the wait lists are long. So really just kind of trying to break it down from there. Um, so that was a lot. We're going to be going into breakout rooms here shortly, but when we do, we're going to be going into Miro board. So um, Miro board has uh, it, a bit of a learning curve, and I, um, I'm sorry for dropping it on you as we go into breakout rooms, but you will have one, each of, one of us in each of your rooms to kind of help navigate and scribe if need be. Um, so there are um, different ways to zoom in and out by pinching your fingers or hitting the 
plus minus button on the bottom right. Um, and then you can move the frame. It like makes a little white glove and you'll hit space and kind of like, if the what you have the white glove, you can move it around. Otherwise, um, it's just a cursor. Um, and then I have existing sticky notes across the board for you to just click and type into. So you don't have to create new ones. You can just type into the existing ones um, and you can add new ones as needed. So that's a lot. Again, we'll go into it in rooms and we can kind of talk it through together more. Um, we're going to go into those breakout rooms. Um, everyone will have their own map. I've broken you up regionally, which will be the next slide. Um, and we are going to start filling out your map. So my best recommendation for this is everyone go around the room and say, hey, my name is, here's where I work and put yourself on the map. Where do you fall in that eco map? Um, and then um, working your way out from there, you can decide as a group if you wanna focus in one bubble or if you want to kind of just like, kind of start adding stuff and then kind of narrate to each other as you go. It's really up to you in your space. Um, we're not trying to finish the whole map today. This is just an example tool that I can send templates out for later that you can actually use on your own to really for your community. Um, so how we broke out groups today, um, it changes every um, changes every meeting depending on who's registered. And best my best way to do it for as close to location based as we can was breaking it up into these different regions of our state. So we've got the um, Olympic Peninsula and South Sound, we've got Central and North Sound, and then we've got the East Side. So I'm going to open up those rooms. We're gonna be in them for about 30 minutes um, and we'll go straight into a break at until 11.05. Um, and again, you'll have facilitators in your room. So we'll repeat this again, but please take a look at where you are on this map. And if you think that you, are, you shouldn't be with that group, join the other group. It is actually um, your choice which group you're in. So I'm going to open those breakout rooms now and let you all join them. Again, we will um, wrap up our breakout rooms at 11 and have a break until 11.05. Um, Sammy and Kayla will each be in a room and I will be joining in the east side room. So if you are the east side room, hang tight while I make sure everyone gets a place to be. Um, so the breakout room should have just opened for you um, and you should be able to hit to the right of the name of the room, join room. Um, and if you're having issues getting into a room, please message me or just put in the chat where you're trying to be and I'll move you over there. Sweet, all right. So thank you so much for joining in those breakout rooms. I hope that you were able to get something out of it. I know it can be hard when I, you're in a space with folks from a very large region. Um, the idea of this was to start, just start connecting and get your head kind of wrapped around the idea of eco mapping. Um, this is something that I will send out templates for with my follow-up email. So you'll be able to access um, and do kind of for your more, your smaller region, if you would like. Um, it's also something if you're interested in doing with me or someone else from Building Changes, like reach out to us, send us an email. We can see how we can connect um, and we'd love to do that with you. Um, so with that, I think we are gonna jump into our next section here. Um, I also just want to highlight, um, I saw it when we were coming back from the break, there were some connections being made. Um, I One of my favorite parts of breakout rooms is maybe you get to hear from folks that are in your area that you haven't connected with before or hear about an idea or a resource that you didn't know about. Um, so please make sure if you were connecting with somebody in a breakout room and you want to learn more about what they're doing, who they're connected to, send them a chat, get their email, connect, make, make that time um, to use each other as a resource find that partnership, but <laughs> all right. Um, I think I'm in kind of a goofy mood this morning. Thanks for bearing with me, team. Um, so this next section is strategies for partnership. Um, this is uh, now that you've kind of networked with your community and uh, what's next? You've started thinking about those partnerships. Um, so we are going to kind of come up with, we're giving just kind of a list of strategies, some examples of things that we've seen and found useful in creating and sustaining partnerships. So 
y'all found this very quick when we were doing the uh, word cloud earlier. Communication was one of the big ones in the middle. And we all know how powerful and important communication is in partnerships, specifically consistent communication, right? Like it's really difficult when you've been working with someone and then all of a sudden you don't hear back. And you're not sure if you can, you know, continue to utilize them. Are they still a resource, right? So that consistent communication, making sure you're on the same page is huge. Um, one way to do this is by setting up regularly scheduled meetings with the stakeholders involved, creating an open line for communication. Um, and it's also an opportunity to, to, con uh, to continue to develop rapport with each other. Um, so one strategy that I've used for this is getting consistent meetings on the calendar ahead of time. We know our work is wild. It changes every day. You don't know exactly what's gonna happen. But if you have a meeting on your calendar to at least tell you like, hey, this is our monthly check-in with building changes, I'm using myself as an example, then we know, okay, we have that coming up. We're not gonna make it, but we can reschedule it. So the meeting still happens. Cause if you're kind of in a, in a space of just needing to schedule as you go, sometimes it, it's easy to have those meetings fall off the radar. So having them um, consistently on the calendar ahead of time, even if they get rescheduled um, can be a key strategy there. Um, other ideas in supporting communication, depending on the relationship with the school or your organization, setting up weekly or biweekly case conferencing. Um, I've seen this be very successful with um, housing providers um, and service providers communicating with the school. You know, you gotta consider what levels of like release of information need to be signed under FERPA and all of that. So that, that is a part of the partnership process. Um, but if you, once you pass that level, you can start those case conferencing opportunities and be able to actually check in about um, the families that you're working with and have that direct line of communication and needs. Monthly check-ins, you could do annual or semi-annual partnership events. Those are, um, those can be a really great way to get to know each other in your organization. This could be one or two organizations, or it could be kind of a, a provider group in general. Um, but we've seen this done in a cool way where you share food. Everyone kind of takes a turn presenting like who, who they are and what services they offer from their school or organization. And then just really taking that time to uh, get to know each other. Um, it's really powerful to share food um, and any opportunity to do so now that we are um, a little more safe to do so in this pandemic, please do so. Um, and then including partners in relevant and existing meetings, right? This one, again, it can really look depend on kind of what, what meetings are going on and what you're doing. An example was when I was working for an academic support program um, in a school, I was through an outside nonprofit, but I was invited to the MTS meet, MTSS meetings as they related to the students that I worked with. And that was a really powerful way to be able to um, kind of have that alignment with the school and what we were doing to support our students. All right, so this is um, another kind of list of tips and tricks of the train. Um, this is from uh, the Coalition for Community Schools slash Institute for Educational Leadership, the nine elements of effective school community partnerships, right? So um, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but I do wanna highlight a few that I find particularly um, helpful. So number one, um, a leadership team comprised of school and community stakeholders. Identify who your leaders in this work are gonna be so there are those consistent points of contact, right? Um, it can be really important to engage the school principal, specialized in st instructional support personnel, parents, families, students, community leaders, and get, getting folks involved in the planning, implementation, um, in the evaluation and evolution of that school community partnership. Um, so number three, have a designated person located at the school to lead the coordination of school community partnerships. This can be somebody whose actual title is partnership coordinator <laughs> or someone that you know is your building point of contact that um, keeps that consistent line of communication available and can kind of collaborate. Um, sometimes this role really easily falls into the McKinney-Vento uh, liaison scope of work and other times it's helpful to have that point person be someone else. Um, you know your community and um, the different roles you all hold. And number four, having clear expectations and shared accountability for the school and community partners. So delineation of roles and responsibilities for school personnel and community providers enhances the efficiency and effectiveness of service delivery while ensuring that the needs of the schools are being met and the students. So 
really having clear expectations. We're gonna have a, some uh, great resources on ways that you can do this um, shared through Anne, who I see on the call already. Um, she's gonna point out a couple different tools that um, her organization has that can help kind of start thinking about this a little bit more. Um, and then one other example I wanna share for this is having a monthly providers meeting. Um, this is something that we've seen kind of across the state in different ways. If you um, can bring together your service providers for your area on a monthly basis, you spend that time to um, A, make sure you're connecting, people know who's in the room, and B, you can use that time to share opportunities and programs that are available, right? So you kind of ask folks who wants to share this, like who wants to present to the group this month, and folks can come present and talk all about their program, if they have grants available, things like that. Um, all right, sustaining partnership. All right, you've made your partnership. Like, what are the key pieces to sustain it? Um, knowing who to contact, we've talked about this. Um, making sure you don't just have one point of contact, like you need a main point of contact, but if you just know one person and that person leaves their role, we know there's turnover, how is that partnership going to uh, sustain past that staffing change? So thinking about how to make that sustainable piece. Um, how to document the, car the partnership? Do you have action teams um, with goals? Are, how are you getting student and parent involvement? Um, do you have a framework for how you wanna reach those goals together? Um, are you getting feedback from everyone involved? Um, and how are you noting and sharing the progress and challenges of the partnership? And then again, for that consistency and reliability piece, really having clear delineation of roles and responsibilities. And when possible, and we know this can be a big ask, especially um, with student data, is there shared access to school-based data systems or data points? How are you sharing information about um, kind of what's going on? And even if that's just kind of sharing your McKinney-Vento numbers or the an aggregate form of what needs are being accessed or asked for, right? Thinking about that. And another really kind of one of the, our last kind of tip and trick that we're gonna share for building and sustaining partnerships is showcasing your partnership, that visibility, right? Share space with each other as much as possible. Attend each other's events, right? Are, is your organization or school putting on a resource fair? Can you invite the Boys and Girls Club to come? What about the, um, the food bank, right? Making sure that you have opportunities that you're showing the students and families that you partner with each other and you work with each other so they can have that trust um, in going to that community partner. Um, so this could be resource fairs, back to school nights, um, cultural events, again, food. Food is a powerful thing. Food gets folks involved, it gets people talking, um, can be a great way to uh, encourage attendance as well. <laughs> um, and with McKinney Vento, you can think about ways to, you know, have that be a support opportunity for families as well. Um, and parent-teacher conferences, how are we showing up in, on those nights as well? Because we know that's the time that a lot of parents are coming through. Um, and, all right, that was kind of a lot I just threw at you. And we're going to um, move to our next section, unless anyone has any quick questions or examples that you would like to share on how you've created or sustained partnerships. All right, I'm not seeing anyone jumping for the hand raise button or unmuting. So if anything pops up in the chat, we'll make sure to note it and share it. But then we're going to continue on to our next section. Um, we are super excited to have Anne Powell Arias joining us. She's the Director of Programs and Partnership over at the Youth Development Executives of Kent County, YDEC, as we lovingly call them. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to Sammy and Ann for this next part of our session today. Just want to own that I said YDEC earlier without saying youth development executives um, of King County. So, and I apologize for, and crew, everyone here today, I apologize for jumping to that YDEC. Now you know what I meant. <laughs> um, so we're super lucky to have you, Ann. I would just love if you want to introduce yourself, maybe a little bit about YDEC, that would be a great place to start. Great, thank you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Ampel Arias, Director of Programs and Partnerships at WIDEC, and my pronouns are she and her. And uh, WIDEC is a coalition of over 100 youth serving organizations in King County, Washington. And we uh, work in a number of different areas. We're a capacity builder for youth serving organizations. Um, we advocate on behalf of the field at uh, local and, and state levels. And we provide tools and, and resources to support the field um, in its work. And one of the areas in which we've built some tools and resources is within school community partnerships, which is a passion of mine. I've been working in cross-sector partnerships really almost since the beginning of my youth development career. So excited to join today. So, so good to hear. Um, I, I love hearing your background. I love, even though we've done this training a couple of times, I do love being able to see you and hear from you again. So thanks again for joining us. Um, okay. We're just gonna start with like, what are the types of partnerships that schools and organizations might engage in? And maybe some examples of those? Yeah, sure. And um, I will actually go ahead and share my screen to give a few examples while I'm talking so I can kind of showcase some tools as, as we go along. Um, first of all, just so you all are aware, one of the resources that we have built and support with community over time and which continues to be refined um, over the years is this school and community, community partnership toolkit. And it covers all sorts of different stages within partnerships. So everything from kind of assessing your own readiness to partner to what does it look like to evaluate programs and not just evaluate programs together, but evaluate our partnerships. Um, so how are we doing the work together? Um, so we have our, that resource here on our website and you can kind of go and explore it from a, a number of different angles. We'll make sure you get links to that um, after this. But one of the tools that we have, um, and this is kind of the overview of that tool, is this partnership type identification checklist. And so one of the things that we have found helpful in thinking about partnership is to think about what sort of partnership are we in, as well as like, what are we pursuing? And are, are we and our partner trying to pursue the same kind of partnership? Um, and one of the ways to think about that is um, this idea of a cooperative, collaborative, or integrated partnership. A cooperative partnership is really where you're, um, you recognize that there are some shared goals that you have. You might meet at the beginning of the year to kind of say, hey, what's an agreement we're making because we're both operating program, you know, program and services for young people at the same site, but we're really going to stay out of each other's business. Collaborative is where you're doing some more things together. So you probably meet at least quarterly. Um, you're getting some input from each other on some of the major decisions that you make. There's some ways in which you influence each other's work. Um, and you still have autonomy to kind of make the final decisions um, over the work that you're responsible for. Integrated, this is the kind of thing where typically, like if you're working at a school site, there usually aren't more than like three integrated partnerships at a school site. We did a, some work this summer in Seattle Public Schools, kind of talking with school principals about like what's really, really as realistic. Because sometimes, as a, I've been a community partner for many, many years, and as a community partner, sometimes like we think we really want that, and like our school systems aren't set up, they don't have the capacity to manage that kind of partnership. Um, so integrated partnerships are pretty unique, and that's where you're really working together to set the goals, the vision, to make some decisions together. You're coming together, you know, at least monthly, um, if not weekly, to be in discussion with each other, the leads that are working from each organization on the partnership. Um, there may be that there's a collaborative of organizations working together, and then you have, um, you know, a leadership body that is kind of organizing and managing that work. That's another way that it can look like, um, but that one is much more integrated and partnerships, partners often describe themselves as sort of greater than the sum of their parts when they're working together in that way. So this is a tool. We also have tools that kind of look at shared vision and leadership, align responsive implementation, which is like how you work together and shared accountability for success each of those in more detail. So if there's like an area in which you're trying to dive in deeper and figure out like, where do we wanna be and what, what actions would we be taking at that level? That's a tool to support you as well. 
I just have to say, I love the way this is organized um, and how it helps you understand kind of the depth of your partnership, as well as that commitment level and what it could look like. I just think it's so great to see it illustrated this way. Um, kind of shifting a little bit, but what are some of the practices that support partnership management and clear communication between partners? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, Joy mentioned was the idea of really defining roles and responsibilities. And that's definitely, you know, it's never too late <laughs> to go back and say to your partner, hey, I think I was just talking to someone the other day who's trying to figure out like, ooh, we might need to have a conversation, revisit this idea of like, who's doing what and how and what's the timeline and who's responsible for what. And one of the tools that can support that is this partnership charter planning tool. Um, so that tool just really looks like, and it has some of the categories you and your unique partnership might have other sort of categories of work, um, but everything from like, who's really the lead to like, who do we go to um, within our partnerships? Because sometimes it's not the people who like decided on the partnership, right? Like it might've been an executive director and a principal who like formalized the partnership, but then it's an assistant principal and a program manager who are doing the work together. Um, so knowing who that is, um, Joy mentioned uh, data sharing agreements if applicable. So like, when will that data be collected and how, what's that agreement? Um, you know, are we using space? Are we sharing space together? What agreements are we making around that? Um, so just as a tool to be able to support um, defining those things. Another tool that we um, put together that can support um, really managing partnerships is to, to know what you want to talk about and have some ideas about what that might look like over the course of a year. And again, whether you have a cooperative or integrated partnership, it's going to look different. And so what we really try to do is say, like, here are some of the things that might be encompassed within your partnership, figure out what are sort of the, the priorities. Um, and also what's possible given your kind of partnership structure um, to include in those meetings and see if there's ways, you know, one of the ways to work towards equitable partnership is really for everyone to be invested in like what are, you know, making sure we're getting what we need out of our meetings that both of us have an opportunity as partners to express what our needs and interests are to move the work forward. Um, so that includes checking in on what's working well, what could be improved. Um, Again, not just about in terms of like whatever services are being offered, but also how are we working together? Are we, you know, do we understand each other's communication preferences and things like that? So that's another tool that can support folks in, in managing partnerships. I think these both are great in so many ways. And I know that all of us have probably been in a meeting that's like, this isn't really the best use of my time. You know, and so keeping that communication open and being able to say, like, let's go back to, you know, that original kind of idea we had together, that shared vision, or, you know, let's talk about how we can best utilize our time together, because we know capacity is, is, a, is a key part of all of this, right? And so being intentional is so important um, with folks' time. I also love just having these tools, you know, your fingertips if you need maybe some help organizing or questions to ask how to ask them um i think this is so again so great to hear about um was, we've covered different pieces of kind of how to do a meeting or you know what it could look like and these different tools um and how like what if you're like i want to talk to the we were talking about um big brothers big sisters earlier today i want to talk to this org of my community um i really hope to like start a partnership how do you or like what would you offer to folks um around like how do you know about your readiness to partner or um you know how do you know when's a good time to like have that initial meeting and what preparation might be involved yeah, thanks for that question, Sammy. So one thing that one tool that we have to guide folks is we have both a, um, some guiding questions to building a partnership ready school, as well as guiding questions to build a partnership ready organization. So depending upon where you're coming at this from, this one that I'm showing here is the example of a partnership ready school. And so 
one of the things that we really recommend to folks is to, to really think about why, like why, what's our rationale? Why are we investing in partnerships? Um, what is the, I often ask people to, to articulate what, what is it about partnering with another organization that's help, going to help us to achieve our goals, to achieve our mission, to be able to support youth um, in the way that, um, that we're trying to, you know, and or, and or how will it help us change systems? What is it about partnership that will get us there? Um, and what do we understand about our own goals and vision, as well as what are we learning about the goals and vision of our potential partner that that makes us think that there could be alignment and having some understanding of that before going into an initial meeting with a partner, I think can prepare better prepares you for, like you said, Sammy, the capacity is hard, right? We're all stretched pretty thin within these systems of youth development and education. So how do we come in with that preparation before um, a meeting? Um, and then one of the things that we encourage schools to think about is like what partners already exist in our school and how are those going? You know, are we putting in place the supports that are needed to really ensure those partnerships are successful? So what else, what other things that we can take, can we take on and who can hold that? Like, again, recognizing it can't be that a principal is holding all of that or there's some partnerships that other folks in the building have. Um, what operational structures can be built to support the work? Um, what's our school culture that promotes um, partnership? I really love, Joey, what you shared about the visibility, like just having, I remember when I was a community partner working at an elementary school um, in New York City in the North Bronx, and we had an after school program for students, for 175 kids, so pretty big part of the st student population. And I was so excited when I got that bulletin board that it was like in the front hallway. Like I was aiming for that bulletin board for a long time, <laughs> just like because it helped to make our program visible and, and helped um, teachers and parents and guardians and other folks in the school to understand what we were doing because so many folks didn't see the work in action because it happened in after school hours. So here we could really share some highlights of, of what was happening with our young people in the after school environment. So. Um, anyway, those are some suggestions, and this is a resource to support folks. And then I wanted to just do a quick um, plug for another tool because it's a new version, something that we've been working with some other partners on um, over the last six months. And it kind of pulled together a bunch of different resources that we had into one, which is this school community partnership design and planning tool. So if you're putting a partnership together for the first time, this is a tool that kind of helps to guide you with some of those initial meetings and thinking through a shared vision. Um, what's the outline of the program or project, the work you're going to do together? How will you work together? What resources are being allocated? And then like, how will we evaluate and what will be our reflection on our linear continuous improvement process? So that's, that's another resource. So great. I, um, as you're speaking, I just am reflecting on like, partnerships are such complex relationships. <laughs> and so I think you've definitely highlighted both like all the great things that can come, but that there definitely is like these, this work, right? And this kind of sharing of vision and all of those things can be huge key pieces that will either, you know, help strengthen or, or maybe make some partnerships a little bit challenging. So I just love the scope. Um, the last question that we were going to ask today, Anne, was what are some of the practices to consider as you're building or strengthening a partnership that will enable it to last over time, including through changes in leadership? Yeah, that's, that's uh, I was, we were doing a cohort yesterday with some folks who are working in partnership and um, you know, it was soon as somebody mentioned turnover, and there was just was like a lot of buzz in the air. It was like, oh yeah, we know. Like in in um, both community based organizations and schools and school districts, there is a fair amount of turnover. And now I'm trying to find the tool that I um, was going to share with you for this. So we do have again a tool, but I think you know so many of the things that um, I think Joey that you mentioned really were 
really do support sustainability. We have a similar sort of framework for thinking about things. Um, oh, this is the where it is. It's, we have one for a school and um, school leaders and then one for community partners. So if you're a school leader, for example, um, I could pull that one up. Um, one of the things that we found and we developed this checklist around um, is this framework for thinking about sustainability. So when we think about sustainability, there's relationship building, there's strategic communication, there's documentation, there's partnership and program quality, and then there's resource development. Those factors together, if you're working in all of those domains, that will support you to have a more sustainable program and partnership. So just a few examples to highlight of that is like, if you're a um, uh, school leader, you know, encourage your community-based organization partner to participate in school-wide events, invite them in, um, you know, introduce yourself to more than just the program lead so that there are multiple people from each organization who at least have had the chance to connect. Um, when it comes to documentation, um, keeping a file on the partnership program, even if it's just like a dis brief description, or if you use that program design and planning tool, like put it in a folder, um, that could be accessed by the next person um, who comes into a role, because sometimes that those that um, institutional knowledge gets lost when there's turnover, and then folks are starting from scratch again, um, and that can be really difficult and, and can interrupt service delivery. Um, and then, you know, I think the other one other opportunity is really to think about diversifying funding sources. And I think sometimes, um, you know, school districts and community based organizations aren't always aware even of the, the ways that sometimes school funding um, can actually support partnership. And so um, looking into that to understand what are those possible resources so that maybe both organizations are investing some funding into um, the continuing the program and being able to sustain it. So those are a few suggestions um, that come from our checklist and really do encourage folks um, to at least be taking a, uh, some of those steps within the domains to support um, their partnerships. So that again, we really have that, that ecosystem of supports for young people that does um, continue over time. So we're meeting the me needs of young people and their families. I just want to say thank you again, Anne. In a very short amount of time, I feel like we have offered multiple links and also with your guidance of kind of how would I even think about, you know, trying to use this one. And um, I think we've gotten tons of resources in a short amount of time. And I also want to say um, just thank you for the wealth of knowledge that you bring um, to this training today and um, to King County. I am going to, we have another partner that we are going to hear from today and um, I'm going to hand off to Joey, but I wasn't sure if we wanted to open for questions. Um, yeah. Have a little bit of time for that. Yeah, I would say let's let's take like a couple of minutes for um, if anyone from the group has any questions for Anne before we move to our next speaker. Um, I'm going to remove spotlight so it's back into a community view. So hold on here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so does anyone have any questions for Anne? And again, that was a ton of links. They will be shared out. I have a beautiful slide that Anne helped me put together that has organi organized by different topics and links to the different tools in the toolkit. It's just you wait for the, that, slide, that slide to be shared with you um, after this training. But does anyone have any questions for Anne about YDEC, about any of the tools shared today? Not, I'm not seeing any thing popping up in the chat. Feel free to come off mute. All right, Natasha, I saw you come off mute there. I did, yes, I just wanted to make sure and I was being respectful, but since I knew, and I know we have a lot of links, my question to Anne, since I'm brand new in my community and 
what is like a good icebreaker? So reaching out and making like introducing myself. I know that I have posters and I can put like Melinda Dyer as a contact. What would you suggest as I'm trying, like even our local gym, um, I had said in our breakout room, how, what is like a good icebreaker in, I wouldn't even say selling this program, but hey, building this partnership so that we are all hands on deck for our community, our homeless, our families and our students. I like that question. What sort of organization do you work for? So I work for Central Youth School District and I am okay. the new McKinney Vento Homeless Liaison. And um, I'm not from here, but I have been here since I was a sophomore and I now have three kids of my own inside the district. So I'm very well connected and I know so many people and I feel like I could use like my mom hat to also build some of these relationships. <laughs> um, my kids are athletes. And so I just, and I work at inside the alternative high school. So I work right next to Thorbex. I know the new owner. I've met some of the people at Salvation Army, but I haven't gone to every single church. Um, I haven't even gone and introduced myself to all of these hotel chains. You know what I mean? And I do feel overwhelmed, but I, I know that I can make a positive impact. I would just, while we have you here, what would be like your five minute spiel on where I can get started and <laughs> how to make these beautiful connections? Well, I mean, I think, and I, you may have, I think, done something like this earlier in this session, but that idea of like mapping out your ecosystem, it sounds like you're already doing that. Yes. Um, the idea like, I mean, the thought that comes to mind is like people who care about youth tend to want to talk about it. Um, and so I think like coming in with um, like a question about, you know, what do you do um, right now? Or like, what, what are you noticing in the community? Being curious about what other people in the community are noticing about what the needs are and what they're doing to support youth, maybe what their strengths are. Because I think sometimes mm -hmm. if we start just like with, you know, kind of a youth development approach, if we start from from assets and like, what are the assets that we both bring to this community, then that can find be a way yeah. to build that initial connection. So that's where I would, that's where my mind goes first. Okay, building together. I love that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, that was a fantastic question. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you, Anne, for your great response. Um, we are going to move to our next speaker for today. Um, again, thank you, Anne, so much for the wealth of knowledge and the resources and the tangible tools that you bring to us. Um, that's, uh, I, I love being able to walk away from today knowing that folks have um, access to all of YDEX toolkits. Even if you aren't King County, it's on the web, right? <laughs> so it's um, just such a great resource. And thank you again for joining us. All right, I'm gonna share my screen briefly before I jump into our next speaker is the one and only Sarah Michelle Leonard, who is a family liaison um, in Renton School District, coming at us live from her role as a community and schools uh, staff member based in the Renton schools. So that is a level of partnership that um, Sometimes it's hard for me to untangle, and I think it's a great example of an integrative partnership using Anne's yeah. language. <laughs> we are, uh, in some ways, I am neither fish nor fowl. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, like Joey said, I am a member of the Renton School District, but I am also an employee of communities and schools of Renton Tukwila. Um, and so, what that means for me is there's some really lovely benefits. Um, uh, I get to work with faith partners a lot easier than I think sometimes school districts get to. I have a nonprofit status number um, of my own that I can go get donations from. On the negative side, I'm part of sometimes not a very nimble, smaller organization. I have double the paperwork uh, and I'm also part of an institution sometimes that doesn't always work well with others. Um, and so there's lots of things that are great and there's lots of things that are challenging. Um, and I've been in this role for about six years. I'm at two schools. One is it in South Seattle and Skyway, and one is in the Renton Highlands. Um, they are both Title I schools with fairly large populations of students who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness. Obviously, post-COVID, uh, the needs are broad and wide, um, and a lot of families are experiencing stuff. Um, and even before COVID, we really started to look at how we were doing our community partnerships differently. Um, and I have to say, uh, and shout out, YDEC is amazing. I've used some of your guys' tools before. 
Um, and it's so wonderful just to start those conversations. And I really recommend people just look at the questions because it means you're not having to reinvent the wheel. Um, this is a lot of the work that the Renton School District has been doing over the last six years is around focusing around how to bring in these community partnerships. We recognized a couple things as a district. Um, first of all, there were certain areas of the district, Skyway and the Westall area in particular, where I grew up and work, um, has been systematically underfunded and under-resourced, not just by us, but by all kind of governmental organizations for the last 40 some odd years. Um, and so we knew we needed to bring resources and community groups and community organizations for that. And to do that well, you need to bring lots of people to the table, but you also need to have strong frameworks. And so I think if you are, whether you're at a building level, at a community partner level, um, or at a district level, making sure you have frameworks like some of the stuff that YDAC has is so important to making sure that you just don't wander off into the weeds. Um, so yeah, in terms of my role in particular, um, like I said, it shifted a lot. I used to be a lot more case management. Um, so primarily, again, working with students and families that are my Kinevento identified. Um, but now a lot of my work has shifted to almost more family engagement. So I run two different family rooms in my buildings. You can see like clothing bins behind me in this family room. Um, I'd run a lot of evening and weekend events. So um, I've got a food resource fair coming up next week. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I've got a car seat event where families can come and get free car seats and get them checked and make sure they're, they're done correctly. I run free book fairs. And the reason that our model has changed is we recognize that what helps McKinney-Vento families benefits everyone. And if you look at McKinney-Vento work through the lens of compliance, through federal protections, um, that's wonderful, right? Because it does allow you to dig in with families. But really, if you look at through the lens of family engagement, it gives you so many more options. I think it changes the way that you bring in partnerships. And again, you just benefit so many more families and schools. And I would say, from my point of view, our school culture just became so much more inclusive, um, curious, welcoming. When we stopped looking at McKinney Vento identified students as that little particular group of students, and we're offering those services for everyone at a whole. Um, and it has meant that our family engagement has, has massively increased and that our family connections are much stronger. Um, to give you an example, um, I have, I think 34 students right now out of 350 identified uh, as McKinney Vento at one of my buildings. Um, through the work that we're doing, and a lot of it is through a lovely grant that I got through Building Changes, um, we were able to really prioritize making sure our families um, could come to events, had the ability to do so. Uh, 29 of my 34 students have been to at least four evening events this year at Bryn Mawr, which is massive, right? That doesn't count all the daytime stuff and, and all the other things that we're doing, but for families to make that time and that effort to come to buildings after school is huge. Um, and so, like I said, switching that lens from case managed services sort of in you know school district little tier three services to family engagement has has been wonderful for us um in terms of partnerships that i have right now um, i'm fairly lucky our district um through what was called the riz partnership or the Renton innovation zone brought in a lot of different community partners and that was part of the work that i was talking about like i said bringing in these community partners because the fact is as educators we wear too many hats um, and we can't wear them all and we can't wear them well. And more importantly, there's people in your community that are already doing the work and doing it well. And so how do you bring them into the building um, in a way that is beneficial for everyone? Um, and so uh, I, like I said, I've got district partnerships, which are great because they handle the MOUs and things like that. And that has been a rocky process. And then I have partnerships that I've made myself. And a lot of that is with like food partners, um, so I partner with like Northwest Harvest and Food Lifeline, Backpack Brigade, the YMCA does food services for us. And so that would be example of partnerships for different needs and different levels. So Backpack Brigade handles weekend backpacks for us, as does the YMCA. Uh, food Lifeline and Northwest Harvest helps us do our food pantries and our food resource fairs. Emergency Feeding Program provides emergency food boxes and things for our evening events. So I work with multiple partners to make sure those multiple needs are filled. 
Um, I have a ton of clothing partners. Um, I work with a lot of housing case managed partners because the, I am a generalist, not a specialist. And so I do want to make sure that my families, when they have the higher need, because I don't do as much case management now, are hooked up with a case management person that can provide service year round. Because of course I'm in a school district and I don't work year round, unfortunately. Um, so one of the things that is really clear when you're working with partners um, is making sure that it is a partnership. Um, I tend to lean kind of using Anne's chart on the more collaborative or integrated side of partnerships. Because again, a lot of the partners I'm working with are very small nonprofits. And I wanna make sure that I'm helping sustain them and build their capacity just as they're sustaining us and building our capacity. And so in order to do that, one of the things that we do every year with our partners that are in our buildings is we do intakes with them, just like I would a client, right? What's going on? What is their capacity like? What are their funding streams like? What are the things that they're trying to get off the ground that maybe I had no idea about? And hey, that actually fits with our after school programming. Making sure you have those conversations. Um, you know, I try to have one at the beginning of the year and then one kind of mid to the end of the year just like I do a needs assessment for a building or a family, I'm gonna do that for my group. Because it's really important for me, like I said, to make sure that I am supporting them just as they're supporting us. Um, I think when you also start with that level of transparency and communication, it just means that life is better for everyone. Once we get our groups in the building, make sure that they are connected in the way that any other staff would be. Obviously, FERPA is a thing, so maybe I can't get them logged into the computer system. But I am going to make sure on a building level, I'm taking them around. Do they have the bathroom code? Do they know what happens when we have a lockdown drill? Um, you know, do they know what the janitor does? Make sure you take them through when you have a community partner in the building and that they have all of the same resources and knowledge as a new staff member would be. Um, because again, if they have the knowledge, they have the, the trust, you're just going to have a much better relationship. Um, that being said, you do wanna make sure that you remain flexible. Um, growth can be challenging. Um, a really good example, one of my favorite groups that I work with is this absolutely amazing group um, led by a wonderful woman named Latanya Horace. And it's called the Silent Task Force. And Latanya has been working in a variety of capacities, but mostly running mentoring groups in Seattle and the South End for 20, 25 years. And we were really lucky in 2018, she became one of our partners and she came in running mentoring groups for uh, fourth and fifth grade students of color. And it was absolutely amazing because at Bryn Mawr, the school that we we're working at, our staff was primarily white. Our staffing was really low. And so having times where we could check in and have mentoring sessions and these check-ins with kids, which are so important for SEL growth and just all sorts of other reasons, it just wasn't happening. Um, and so bringing in a person from the community that had shared lived experiences, um, that that was literally their job was just massive. And we really got lucky because LaTanya was able to come in. We developed some really great leadership programs that she did that were student led, um, just wonderful stuff. And then COVID hit, right? And school shut down. And so then, you know, we had that moment of like, okay, great. We have these community partnerships, now what? Um, and so again, it was, it was a very frank conversation with our, our community partners of, okay, how do we make this work? How are you pivoting? How are we pivoting? Um, what ended up happening is our community partners helped us to reach out to about 60% of the school. And we did um, kind of large family interviews to find out what families needed. And then based on that, we're doing, you know, bi-weekly resource fairs and all things like that. So that was kind of a year and a half of pivoting. Well, by the time we kind of emerged from COVID, their organization had changed so much that they weren't doing the same sort of mentoring groups. So whereas before I would have Latanya running the mentoring groups, now she has five or six staff members that come in instead, which was wonderful, right? It means her capacity is a lot bigger, but it was a shift. And again, those, those dynamic conversations have to happen. Um, sometimes it can be really tricky. Um, she now works in, I think, six different rent and schools, which is great. I don't get a chance to talk with her quite so much, um, but we have wonderful people that work under us. Um, and so that's an example of how I think as a building and as a district, we were able to support a really fantastic nonprofit group. Um, it has helped us because we have had really powerful, meaningful uh, student mentoring groups that have led to some great leadership opportunities. Um, and, 
And then also just voices in the building that were badly needed. Um, again, you know, coming from two buildings that are mostly white staffers, it is important that you have voices at the table that are not all alike. Um, because uh, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and when we're talking about family engagement, that's incredibly important. Um, some issues that we've had when we talk about family partnerships, um, I know sometimes there can be difficulties. Uh, a good example is one of our clothing partners that we work with is EBC or Kid Vantage now. Um, as I said, I do resource fairs. Um, in one year, I did over $70,000 worth of in-kind donations from KidVantage out to my families through these resource fairs. Communities and schools saw this. A lot of people were excited about these resource fairs. They wanted to do themselves. Um, and so communities and schools came up with this idea of, well, why don't we do 23 of these events by four different liaisons on three different hills? They went back to uh, KidVantage, and at the time, KidVantage was like, whoa, we don't have that capacity. That's a problem. Um, and it severely damaged our relationship. Um, and so sometimes one of the things that I've noticed that you have to be wary of is there often is a lack of knowledge or sometimes communication between the folks that are doing direct services and the folks that are providing sometimes the admin work or not doing direct services. Um, and I would say the heart of the issues that I have more often than not relate to that. Um, and so again, having that communication of, okay, maybe one building can do this, but make sure you're talking to your partners because not every building can do this. Um, not everyone has that capacity and be realistic about your own capacity when it comes to stuff like that. Um, kind of three takeaways that I would say I have really learned. Um, like I said, the biggest one is, is do and takes with your community partners. Um, make sure that relationships are two-way streets. Uh, power dynamics are huge, um, especially when you have community groups that are uh, you know, not represented within your staff body, making sure that, that people are feeling comfortable, that they're feeling safe, that you are doing the work that you need to do to make sure that the space is a welcoming space is massive. Um, how are you amplifying their work and messaging? Um, are you making sure that they have dedicated space in the building, um, not just on a board, but do they have a classroom? Do they have a desk? Um, do you have a spot on the weekly newsletter where they get to add communication? Things like that, make sure that they are integrated. Um, as a school member uh, or a school employee, um, one of the things that has been massive for me is getting out of the box of thinking 180 days, right? Families need services and support. 365 days out of the year. And so when you're thinking about what services we're providing and how we can better connect with families, how we can better support with families, how we can better engage with families, it needs to be outside of the school day and it needs to be outside of the school year, full stop. Um, and on the, the second side of that is make sure that you're getting constant family and student voice about the work that you're doing. Um, it may show you, yes, you're on the right track, but it may also give you uh, new ideas, new ways to go through or help you improve your practices. Um, and last but not least, um, when you take time to plan with your partners, uh, make sure it's well in advance of the school year, right? You don't wanna just be using them to react to the problems, right? We don't wanna do whack-a-mole. Um, so for example, with the Silent Task Force and two of our other community partners, um, it was not, they could not come and be part of our, our weekly staff meetings, right? There was FERPA things. It also was too much time. So instead, we made sure that they were part of our monthly building leadership team. It gave them that macro and micro view, which meant that they were able to say, hey, we have these things coming forward, or have you thought about this when you're talking about this as a subject? Um, and that level of transparency really helped build our relationship. Um, yeah, so I would say that's kind of the big things that I've learned about partnerships over the last six years, um, don't be afraid to do it. Don't be afraid to push, especially your districts, because a lot of times they think of it as liabilities and what if this happens? Um, and I think the work that we've done really shown that it lets us be educators and lets the people who are already doing the amazing good work in the community come in um, and really do the things that they're already great at. So, yeah. Um, Thank you so much, Sarah Michelle. You just gave such an incredible picture of partnerships and collaboration um, and how it's working down in your district. And um, 
although we've worked together closely for a couple of years, I feel like I even, I was pulling out these <laughs> new pieces and um, I just really appreciate um, you sharing with us today. Um, we are almost at the end of our time. So we unfortunately won't have time for direct questions for Sarah Michelle in this space, but if you're willing to pop your email in the chat, maybe folks yeah. could follow up with you if they have any questions. Um, Absolutely. We know that sometimes it can be really helpful to have an example school district to be like, hey, look, they're doing it to show your district. We can do it too, right? To kind of get past that barrier that um, Sarah Michelle was talking about. Well, and I'm happy to, um, you know, I have really benefited from having people like Toby and Building Changes um, and Sammy as well in the past be thought partners. And I think that is one of the biggest things that you can do when you're bringing on community partners is just sit and have those conversations, again, in a structured way with frameworks. Um, but having those conversations really just kind of opens up the doors and helps you get out of that siloed box of school district thoughts. So um, yeah, I'm putting my email in the chat and you guys are welcome to reach out to me. All right. So while Sarah Michelle is putting your email in the chat, we have two whole minutes left. So we're going to roll through it. Um, I'm going to share my screen one last time for our training. Um, so we have um, just a quick overview. Where have we been today? We started conceptualizing partnerships. You thought about it in context of your community through the eco mapping tool. Then you learned different strategies to create and strengthen collaboration with some killer tools from Anne and Wydeck. Um, and also heard about those examples from Sarah Michelle. Um, so we're not going back to breakout rooms. The screen lies, I apologize, but we are gonna be thinking about what are action steps that you're gonna take to implement, um, to create or sustain partnerships in your community after today. So um, we got another Mentimeter. Oh, and I hit enter. It told me to hit enter and then it doesn't, okay. Feel free as we're kind of wrapping up today to type in, what is your action step? Maybe that action step is call, call your local feed, food bank and introduce yourself. Maybe it is set up a partnership planning meeting using one of YDEX tools. Reach out to churches. Um, I do wanna highlight, um, we come from all different parts of the state with different levels of resources. And sometimes the religious organizations like churches, um, as well as rotary clubs, right? can be some of the um, most helpful resources, especially in rural communities. Um, so definitely if you are not connected to some of your local um, religious organizations or rotary clubs, I would reach out to them because um, they can be a great spot to start um, building that connection. All right, and this is where it's like, I don't know if people haven't typed or if it's just not catching up. There we go, reaching out more faith-based. Yeah, specific partner you wanna reach out to, I love it. So this will remain open as I continue. So please continue to put in your, um, ah, share WIDEX information. Yes, I love it. Share the knowledge. This is also recorded. Um, if you wanna share it, we will post it in soon. I don't know exactly how long it takes on our transcription side, but it'll be posted. <laughs> so keep entering your thoughts here. Um, and we'll definitely review them and share them when we share the slides. All right, we are at time. So last minute things, please, 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 please complete that survey monkey. Um, we really appreciate your feedback. Um, I will be sending up a follow-up email with the slides and survey link and all of that again. Um, join our school housing network. It's a monthly meeting, come to future trainings. We've got more on deck this spring um, and um, we have an exciting in-person event that we are planning for May 19th. So mark your calendars. If you haven't gotten that save the date from us, um, reach out to me and we'll try and get you on that list. Um, it's gonna be in-person in Renton, all focused on community partnerships, school, house, or school community partnerships. We're very excited. Um, Anne's gonna join us with some more in-depth looks into some of the tools as well. And that's that, here's our contact info. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we can hang around for a couple of minutes, answer any questions, but that is the official end of our training. <laughs>